Okay, so um, let's let's move on. I mean, I think I think we've covered DRM. Um, this this is not for the this is not for the record, but we've covered the DRM. So the next things that I wanted to talk to you about is, um, I mean, maybe taking uh, taking the discussion bit back to your taking back to your own work again, um, because I'm, I'm I want to know how you feel about like new publishing models for books um, because you've written about it. You've written about fair trade eBooks. Um, you're well known um, as somebody who has licensed quite a lot of their work under an open license. So I think in most cases it's a CC, a creative commons license, mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, and you've always, I mean, you're always very frank about the business models you use and how this can work for you. And I think this can be very useful for our, listeners as well to actually hear from uh, an actual creator right. like how this works in practice because although it's a it's not only about money but people will always ask this question like oh if you make your work available for free online like how do you manage to make a living out of it um i think i think our, re our listeners would be interested in hearing some more about that how your feelings about that yeah you know i i um i think we should start by talking about what publishing is and I've had the same book editor, uh, I met him when I was 17 on a bulletin board system, a dial-up bulletin board system in the 1980s, a guy named Patrick Nielsen Hayden. And he told me something very smart about publishing. And he said, publishing is not printing or preparing an ebook. That's just formatting. That's just like, that's just, that's just the industrial part of it. Publishing is connecting an audience uh, with a, with a work. Right. You identify a work, you identify the audience, you take the steps that are needed to, to connect one to the other. And publishers are pretty good at this in the sense that they have this kind of iterated longitudinal look at how people are buying um, and, and how people are reading and where the money opportunities are. So they, they publish a lot of different books. They publish them every month. They see how they fare. They try different things all the time. And, and, you know, it's always going to be a moving target because the hard problem of like, how do you get anyone anywhere to give a damn that you wrote a book is the hard problem also of advertising. How do you get anyone anywhere to give a damn that you made a thing for sale and politics? How do you give it, get anyone anywhere to give a damn about your ideas? And if there was a simple solution to it, it would have been uh, found and perfected a long time ago. You know, often you'll hear Google and Facebook and even their critics claim that they can use machine learning to just convince people of stuff. There's precious little evidence of that. Uh, everyone who's ever claimed <laughs> to have a mind control ray turned out to be lying to themselves or to us or both, you know, whether that's like Rasputin or pickup artists, they always turn out to be deluded weirdos. So I don't think we should believe big tech when they claim that they've got that either. And one of the things that we know about effective strategies for getting people's attention is that they're short lived that our response to stimulus regresses to the mean. And so even if something works today to get people's attention, next week it won't work. So publishers are, are trying to hit a moving target. Um, the same factors that drove consolidation in all the other industries we've talked about, agribusiness and newspaper publishing and online has also hit uh, trade publishing, book publishing. Uh, we are down to five giant publishing companies. Uh, thanks most recently to the tie up between Bertelsmann, which owns Random House and Penguin, uh, with Simon and Schuster, which had been bought by another conglomerate by CBS, which is a broadcaster and had been bought because the CEO, Les Moonves, who turned out to be a kind of fired in the Me Too scandal, thought that they could, um, milk, uh, Simon and Schuster for good ideas to turn into TV shows that basically never happened. And everyone thought it was a stupid idea, but he was the boss. And as soon as he wasn't the boss anymore, Simon and Schuster went out for sale. And now it's part of the largest publisher in the world. And what that means is that um, if four publishers reject you, you, you've run into big publishers. It also means that if you work in publishing and your resume is rejected by four big publishers, you've run out of all the publishers. Uh, yeah. The publishers themselves one of the reasons they've grown as big as they have is because of consolidation on the retail side. So publishers have historically sold into two major channels. One is called the trade that's bookstores, which in the U S there's one national bookstore left that's Barnes and Noble, which is run now by James Daunt, who runs the one national bookstore in the United kingdom, which is, um, uh, um, Waterstones. 
Uh, and um, there's one major national ebook store in America, of course, Amazon, which is also <laughs> the second largest trade purchaser or the largest online trade publisher. So, so all of this market stuff has collapsed down into a couple of firms and they put the screws to publishers. They demand co-op, which is a fancy way of asking for a bribe to put the book at the front of the store, as opposed to putting the books you think your readers will like the best at the front of the store. James Don says that he's going to end that at Barnes and Noble, but it's long been a feature of, of trade publishing. And then in addition to the trade, there's always been something called, or, or at least since the 30s, there's been something called the mass market. And mass market are books that are sold outside of bookstores because there are far more people who never go to bookstores than people who go to bookstores. I'm the kind of person who goes to bookstores, but I acknowledge that I'm in the minority. And so the, the, the mass market started in pharmacies and grocery stores. Uh, and they were a very diversified market in the US. They were served by 400 distributors. Uh, and the distributors themselves were mostly unionized. And so those uh, spinner racks in the pharmacy and the grocery store would be stocked by unionized Teamsters who would come back every week because they had job security. And because they had uh, collective bargaining, they got bonuses if the books that they put in there sold well. So they would go to the warehouse and pick the books based on what they thought was selling, based on their years and years of experience stocking those, those they were called pockets in these spinner racks. But Again, when Reagan deregulated, we got Walmart. Um, Sam Walton founded Walmart, began to engage in predatory pricing, began to expand very quickly. Uh, and then he was followed by other national big box retailers like Costco and Kmart and so on. And these came to dominate the mass market. And they insisted that there should only be one distributor nationally that they dealt with. They didn't want to open 400 accounts with 400 distributors to get their books. So we had distri distribution collapse as well. So now you have... For a while, you had two distributors. Now you've got one. It's just Ingram. So Ingram puts the screws to publishers as well. So publishers have to be big in order to fight with Ingram. And Ingram has to be big in order to fight with the retailers. And the retailers have to be big in order to fight with publishers. So we're, we've got this hugely monopolized market. Now, there is a middle tier. And the middle tier is quite good, uh, in part because publishers shed so many talented publishing workers through these waves of consolidation, so many great editors and designers and marketers and so on. And so there's a, a whole ton of boutique houses, but they're very fragile because they, they are selling into the same retail environment as the big publishers. So they are constantly scrambling for money. They're constantly uh, uh, hoping that their bills get paid by the big, by the big retailers, because the big retailers can say, oh no, we'll pay you next month. And they don't really, they're not going to say what to Walmart. Well, then we're not going to sell you any more books because they can't survive without them or, or to Amazon or to the, any of the other big retailers or to the big distributors like Ingram. And so they're very, very fragile. And then there's this self-publishing market and the self-publishing market is often doing well. Um, there's a whole group of self-publishers who use Amazon as their platform, who did very well when Amazon was really fighting to steal writers from the big publishers. Now they're facing runaway wage theft and high-handed tactics, and they're, maybe the party is over there. Um, but there's another kind of self-publisher who does very well, which is a self-publisher who has access to a very large non-reader audience. So people who... Uh, are in the self-help industry or the nutrition industry or who write a certain kind of narrow gauge fiction that um, they know there's an audience for and that is not served in the mass market or in the trade. And these are people who don't go to bookstores and they know how to reach them at events or conferences or in online forums. And oftentimes those people do very well. Um, and they, they augment their living from books with things like Patreon and tip jars and so on. And they can do really, really well, even though they're outside of that mid tier or, or large tier. And they sometimes if they do very well a, a, on their own as an indie author, that will give them the leverage they need to negotiate a good book deal with one of the big four publishers. Um, you know, one of the things that um, is hard about the big four is that especially if you're a beginning writer, is they all have pretty poor terms for beginning writers and you can't trade one off against the other. But if you don't need them, right, if you can afford to walk away from the deal, you can often get a better deal. Now, I'm published by one of the big four, the smallest of them, a company called Macmillan that's owned by the von Holtzbrink family in Berlin. 
uh, and they're all over the world. They were a German newspaper family for a long time. I think they've divested of most of their newspaper and scientific publishing and are now, I think they have an, an, an educational publishing arm, but mostly they're a trade and mass market publisher. And they own Tor Books, which is the largest English language science fiction publisher in the world. Um, which is quite good at selling into both the mass market and into the trade. And they do very well by me. And they were very tolerant of me doing experiments with open licensing, as you mentioned, Creative Commons licenses. And I've had books with Tor that have been New York Times bestsellers. And I've had books that frankly flopped and that it wasn't really related to whether they were Creative Commons licensed or not. It seems to mm -hmm. be some mixture of luck and skill and timing the moment and, you know, the the upshot though is that Tor eventually asked me to stop doing it, and with only four publishers, I had to do what they asked. So I don't do Creative Commons licensing for my novels anymore, unfortunately. I regret it, um, but I get a lot out of the relationship. I get enough out of the relationship that it overcomes my regrets, and I'm willing to do it. As to how I made money, I sold books. People bought my books. Mm -hmm. Um, now I one thing that you you alluded to my fair trade ebooks. That's a, a project that Tor. Uh, encourage me to do, and that has been very successful. Um, I run an online bookstore for my eBooks that competes with Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Google Play, uh, Apple, and so on. And the way that it works is you buy your eBooks from me. And so, mm -hmm. typically, if if Amazon sells one of my eBooks, they take thirty percent of it as their commission. They send seventy percent of it to to Macmillan. Then Macmillan takes 25% of that 70% and sends it to me as a royalty. Uh, the way that it works mm -hmm. when you buy it for me is I take 30% and I put it in my pocket and I send the 70% to Macmillan and Macmillan takes 25% of that 70% and sends it back to me as a royalty. It's a little roundabout, but I'm the first one happens when I'm wearing my uh, author or my bookseller hat. And the second one happens when I'm uh, wearing my author hat. And I think that there's a lot to this. I think that um, publishers have been trying to figure out for a long time what to do about Amazon, which is their best frenemy. It accounts for about 40% of their sales, and yet um, they know that uh, Amazon plays hardball. At one point when Amazon was launching the Kindle store and trying to convince smaller publishers to get their um, books into the store at very low prices to make it uh, more worthwhile to buy Kindles, they had an internal project they called uh, Project Gazelle. And they, it was uh, the manager of that project said, we will identify the, um, the mid-sized publishers that are vulnerable to us, like the vulnerable gazelle in a pack and we were in a herd rather, and we will hunt them down like a cheetah and bring them to ground because they're vulnerable to us and we'll force them to do business on our terms. Publishers understand that that wasn't an aberration. It wasn't a mistake, that that is Amazon's business ethic. And they're not happy with the idea that um, Amazon is going to become more and more significant to their business, and they want to figure out how to erase, how to escape it. Ebooks are one of the big ways in which Amazon dominates publishing, far more than than print, and uh, although not as much as audio. And I sell my audiobooks as well. And one of the things that um, having uh, authors run their own bookstores does is it gives readers a, a non commodity reason to buy one edition of an ebook over another. You know, all the ebooks are priced the same thanks to various most favored nation deals between Amazon and 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 the publishers and the other uh, ebook stores. So all the prices are the same everywhere on the internet. Amazon doesn't charge you any less or any more than Barnes and Noble mm -hmm. or than I do. Um, and so what you can say to people is, yes, when you buy from Amazon, it's a little easier to get it on your Kindle. But when you buy from the author, and here's a directory of all the author's websites, um, in fact, here's a plugin for your browser that when you see the book on Amazon, it just replaces the buy for Kindle with the buy from author book. The author gets twice as much money. You're just putting money mm -hmm. in that author's pocket. And um, I think that this is a thing that different kinds of creators groups, ones that are pro creative commons and one that are anti creative commons, um, that they could all get together on this. Uh, and they could, in fact, just sort of build and maintain some infrastructure to help authors self-host this. Ironically, the, probably the easiest way for authors to self-host this is to run it on Amazon's cloud uh, and, uh, and, and you know, just set up some, some automated tools to rent out a little cloud space, put up your own little bookstore, hang out your shingle, register with the central repository or directory of authors' uh, ebook stores. And um, 
you know, the publishers will sell more eBooks. The authors will get more money. Amazon will be less central to their business. I think it's a, a real opportunity. And I'm, I'm, you know, I've been mooting it to various publishers and authors groups for a long time. I'm hoping I get a taker for it. Can I, can I ask just, just a little follow-up sure. question, but it can be off the record if you want to. Why did your publisher ask you to stop? using Creative Commons licenses? Uh, because you said they asked you to stop reading. They were worried that um, uh, ebook sales overall in science fiction were going down. Uh, and mm -hmm. they wondered if if it was Creative Commons. Uh, they were worried about my ebook sales and they were worried about everyone else's ebook sales. Uh, and okay. um, I don't know that it's made a difference. I mean, I would say that, that one of the reasons ebook sales went down would probably be because um, people got tired of reading off of screens. I think that um, ebook sales were were or ebooks were a lot more of a novelty, and for a mm -hmm. long time it made sense to have a dedicated ebook reader because phones were really clunky. You know, a, I think the Kindle actually even predates widespread um, smartphone use, and so people wanted to have a, a Kindle. And you know, one of the advantages of a dedicated ebook reader is that it doesn't tempt you to look at a, a TikTok video of like someone sticking a lemon up their nose. And uh, if if you're on your phone and trying to read an ebook, you're um, you're you're screwed. Mm -hmm. You know, you, every every ten seconds you find yourself tabbing away to see the uh, to see the person putting a lemon up their nose on TikTok, and you never mm -hmm. get any reading done. And I think that people just can't justify. Most people aren't readers; they can't justify buying a dedicated ebook reader. That was always going to be a kind of short live category. And once your your ebook reader is a multi purpose device that can access all of the easy, cognitively lightweight forms of entertainment that the internet offers. It's gonna be very hard to do the kind of um, thoughtful, uh, uh, slow moving uh, reading that is so important to, um, uh, to, to appreciating literature. Uh, I think an, an additional, I mean, an additional, I, I was just thinking about this the other day when I was looking at my, my e-reader e I have a dedicated one I don't read on my phone and I was thinking, like this is this must be one of the most sustainable pieces of hardware I'm probably jinx, jinxing it right now but it's probably one of the most sustainable pieces of hardware I own because I think I've got my it's a Kindle but I think I've got it for like 10 years right. and, and you know like you, chart, you plug it in once every yeah they're months. really <laughs> to last and e-ink is pretty amazing goes. for sure yeah so it's, I mean, there's no real business model in like trying to sell new e-readers neither. I mean, like once you have it, you just, yeah. you have it for uh, quite a while. Um, a little, um, something else about e-books, um, which is something that I, I read about during the pandemic, uh, the Internet Archive, and then they released this National Emergency Library. Mm -hmm. if I'm correct. Yeah. So um, the Internet Archive is um, maybe is sort of this organization who uh, does what's their name says they archive, they offer like an extensive archive of everything that yeah. has, has ever happened uh, online. Um, and, and this was actually uh, under attack from publishers as, as an act of piracy while they were claiming that they were act acting as a, as a library. And so like in, they were in the right to, to lend these, uh, these eBooks who are often, I think, even out of, uh, out of production. So like you couldn't, you couldn't even buy them anymore. Yep. Uh, in, in Doors, yeah. yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I think I think that the impulse that the archive had was a very good one to say that all of the libraries uh -huh. in the world are closed. So just to be to be clear here, the Internet Archive um, scans, book, among many other things, scans books and makes them available online uh, mm -hmm. as a library to one reader at a time using DRM, which is not a thing I'm hugely happy about. Um, that makes sure that only one person at a time reads a book. And the archive is a is a very very uh, uh, privacy centric institution, and really got set up around the time that the war on terror was starting after nine eleven. That's when they really kind of kicked into high gear, and they deliberately built their systems so that they kept as little information about how people were using them as possible, so they could never be compelled to give out that information. And what the Internet Archive did at the start of the pandemic, the start of the lockdown was they eliminated the one reader at a time rule. Uh, they were still, you know, circulating DRM books. They would still self-destruct after a couple of weeks, whatever. But it was just, it just wasn't one reader at a time. Um, and publishers freaked out. And they freaked out for a couple of reasons. So they freaked out for a, a, an understandable reason, which is that the archive couldn't tell them what was, um, 
how the library was being used. Uh, and that was because of their privacy focus. So they literally didn't know how many books they were checking out, what was happening with them and so on. And they, they, they took, I think, precious weeks to build a, uh, some telemetry in, at which point they were able to say, look, the majority of the books that we circulate are, are out of print. They don't have a commercial life. And most of them only circulate for 30 minutes at a time. People dip into them to get a reference. They don't, this is not mm -hmm. substitutive for owning books. This is the kind of thing that you might actually just go down to the library and pull a bunch of books out to get citations from and then leave for. This is, this is exactly analogous. So that's a, it was reasonable for publishers to be worried because they didn't know and they imagined the worst. And, you know, publishers and writers have been uh, really um, hard done by, by a very monopolized market, although publishers themselves have participated in that monopolization. And they have seen intermediaries show up with lots of high-minded talk that just turned into signally unfair uh, commercial arrangements, just just out and out cheating, where, where money was taken out of the pockets of people who really deserved it and stuck in the pockets of, of fast talking hucksters, some of whom turned out to be crooks. Um, and so, you know, it, it's not unreasonable for them to be a little jumpy here, but the arguments that they made were terrible. Uh, the good argument they made is what the hell is going on here? The bad arguments they made is you're not a library. They are a library, right? The, the, there's, there's no U S copyright law does not require that you be a, a town library in order to circulate books. And the Hathi trust decision does not require that you be a university library or a town library in order to circulate books. Of course, they're a library. Um, they are in fact, the largest library in the world, part of some very large consortia of libraries, members of library professional associations. They're a library. It was a, it was an absurd argument to say that they're not a library. Right. You might as well say you're not a library because you don't have pillars out front of your building the way the Greeks did, except that the Internet Archive actually does have pillars out front of its <laughs> buildings. They bought an old church in the Presidio in San Francisco that has these white, I think they're Doric, although they uh, pillars. I'm not sure exactly what kind of pillars they are. So they're they're absolutely a library. And they said, well, OK, but I even if you're a library, um, you should have asked permission. Well, no, libraries don't have to ask permission. That's the whole deal. Libraries do not have to ask permission. Um, libraries have never asked permission. And then they said, well, but ebooks are different because you have to license ebooks. Well, that was the whole point of the Hathi Trust decision is, um, yeah, if you buy the ebooks, the publishers Can you sell. Just explain it? Hmm? I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just uh, interrupting. Could you just explain? Was just the Hathi, Hathi, Trust? Hathi Trust was a, a university library, I believe at uh, U Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, run by Bobby Glushko that um, scanned university books and put them online for the university's students to read and for other universities to read. And there was a copyright lawsuit over it and they won. And the, the basically okay. it established that as a library, if you're a bona fide library and you buy a book, you have the right to scan it and make it available to your patrons, mm -hmm. uh, which is what the Internet Archive does. Uh, and so, you know, obviously, like this specific fact pattern never went to court. But it's a lot. But to argue that ebooks are different and you always have to license them is is manifestly untrue, and we know it's untrue because the Hathi Trust exists. And so you have what amounts to something that is pretty um, uh, benign in terms of artistic living, run by a nonprofit in the midst of an unprecedented emergency that was trying to figure out how to. Uh, um, make sure that the books that cities and schools had spent public money on could be read by the public at the moment the public needed them the most. Because this was, this was at the, especially in the early part of the pandemic, when we weren't sure about fomite transmission, and we thought that you couldn't handle objects that had been handled by people who might be infectious. And so they weren't, they weren't circulating any books at all because they didn't know how to disinfect them. And so, you know, the, the, the idea that we would just deny books to people because we couldn't work out the details was bonkers. Now, I think that if there had been fair trade ebooks, if those ebooks had been for sale somewhere uh, by their authors, especially, you know, the out of print ones, you wouldn't even have to remit the 70% to your publisher. 
And if the archive could have helped set up those bookstores and then directed readers to them who wanted to buy the eBooks, that it would have been very different. I mean, I think that it was really about economic anxiety uh, with both authors and publishers. And I think that the publishers and the authors actually don't have aligned interests here, that um, there's a lot of books that writers would like to take back from publishers uh, that, that are not uh, being sold well. There's a whole reversion element of the U.S. Uh, copyright law that allows authors to take back their books after 35 years. Um, and if there was an easy way to sell those books online, which I think the Internet Archive could really facilitate because they have all these scans of books that were not born digital, right? The only, literally the only digital mm -hmm. copy of these books is in the Internet Archive, um, which they could then give to the authors. So the authors could turn them into commercial editions, which they could sell themselves or sell through their publishers. That's a, that's a, a huge opportunity. And I think it really would have made a difference. And, you know, if we had a time machine and we could do it over again, I don't think we'd do it the way we did it. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm just going to off the record, uh, Matt. We go. I see that we're 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 going over time. Is that okay, Corey? Is that I okay only have really have, about five have... more minutes. Okay, I'm just going to move on to my closing question. All right. That's okay. Um, so, um, so this interview it will appear uh, on a blog called World Culture. It will there will be there will be a book, um, and and there will be some some uh, blog items written by Glenn Moody. Mm -hmm. um, what we wanted to know is, um, was there a particular moment when you hit this wall and you thought there's something wrong here? Basically, everything we talked about is you saying like, this is, there is something wrong here, <laughs> there is something wrong here. But can you tell us like at what moment you really had this, like this a higher lidness that, okay, this is not right? Well, you know what? I think it came about after the Napster Wars. Uh, you know, in the, in the early days of the internet, I remember being on message boards where people were freaking out because science fiction novels were being scanned and posted online. And, you know, um, it, it felt really similar to when my friends and I had like photocopied science fiction magazines and the school photocopier before the office opened in order to share them around. And it felt very weird and unseemly for authors to be calling readers uh, criminals and threatening them and saying, I'm going to take your house away and just all kinds of, of real like hyperbole. And, you know, as someone who'd worked in a used science fiction bookstore and in a library and who had learned about my field by reading books from a variety of sources, many of which did not expect me to pay or the, there was no remittance to the author as with a used book in order uh, when I when I bought the book, I just felt like it was all very unseemly. And then along came Napster and Napster was a remarkable thing. It, it, it emerged at a moment in which um, 80% of the music that had been recorded was not available for sale at any price. You just couldn't buy it in the new market uh, as a record or as a tape or as a CD. I mean, maybe you could find a used copy, but there was no no one actually making it a commercial object. And in, in a year or less, uh, Napster turned all of those books into articles uh, that could be, or all of those all of that music into articles that could be sourced uh, online at the click of a button. And it even had a, a, a plan for turning that into money. They, they had basically surveyed their audience and found that the median Napster user was prepared to spend $15 a month to keep Napster up. They, they just said to the record labels, like, just tell us who owns what and we'll send them the money, right? And, and you can mm -hmm. have it. It'll be the equivalent of people buying a CD every month for the rest of time. And the music publisher said, no, we're going to sue you. We're going to put you out of business. And, um, you know, the moment at which they decided to sue these people and put them out of business was right after the Bush-Gore contested election, right? When, when about 50 million people voted for George Bush and about 50 million people voted for Al Gore and uh, the election went to Bush, he stole the election. But the point being that 50 million people was like, a presidential mandate, enough people to elect a president. Napster had 52 million users in the US when they shut it down. So it could have been this massive political force. It could have been a dramatic realignment of audiences with artists that made intermediaries a lot less important. It wasn't perfect. We would have, It wouldn't make sense for that to be all concentrated into one set of hands, but it was it was an astounding moment for us to be living through. And um, no one stood up. 
Napster got shut down and all of those Napster users, it was like when you walk into the kitchen and turn on the lights and all the cockroaches run under the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. They, they just, they scattered. They said, I guess the party's over. And I looked at that and thought, you know, there are, there are problems with the way Napster is operating today. And there are problems with its plans for operating in the future, but no Napster, right? N putting all that music, taking all the music back off the internet, going back to 80% of our musical posterity being removed from circulation is not a good answer, right? Like that doesn't solve any of the problems that I have with Napster. That's, that's a problem I have in addition to the problems I have with Napster. And so that's when I got involved. That's when I got interested was in figuring out how to do something about this. And, you know, this was the moment at which the record label started to sue music fans. They sued 19,000 children for downloading music. At one point, I think it was 5% of the federal civil docket was just the record label suing children. Uh, it was, it was, you know, ugly and foul and stupid and counterproductive. And as someone who was working in the arts, I could not see how that could ever do well by artists. Okay. So let me just, uh, because I know we're, we're, we're running at the end of this episode, um, like that was a wall you hit and maybe like, just think about how we can break the wall or jump over the wall and, and what do you see, what would you like to see happen in 2030? Well, the reason... Say 2030, can be 2025 yeah. or 2050. Well, you know, the, <laughs> it depends on the reason it. people use big tech platforms is something called the network effect. Uh, the platforms get better the more people there are who use them. So think about Napster, right? Every person who joined up to Napster and added their CD collection to the network made Napster better and also made a reason for other people to join Napster and make Napster better. Every time there's an app for the iPhone, that's a reason to buy an iPhone. Every time someone buys an iPhone, that's a reason to make an app. Every time someone joins Facebook, that's a reason to join Facebook. Uh, people join Facebook to be with the people who are already there. So these network effects are really important in how these firms grow. But the reason they stay big is not network effects. The reason they stay big is switching costs. When you quit these platforms, you leave behind an awful lot. You quit a mobile platform, you lose your apps and your proprietary data, your media. Um, when you quit a um, social network, you lose touch with the people who were there. But you know, the, le the lesson of Napster is you can bring all your media with you. That music on Napster was CD and vinyl and cassettes that people had ripped themselves. There's no reason that it has to be locked to a platform. And the lesson of, of our email systems and other open federated messaging systems is that if you change providers, you, you shouldn't have to lose touch with the communities that you're in. Uh, that, that Facebook and Apple and Google, they have engineered into their systems a high switching cost so that you can't leave without paying a penalty. You can't take your Audible books with you when you leave Amazon or your DRM crippled Kindle books. And what that means is that um, they keep getting bigger and they stay bigger. And so in the next five years, what I would like to see is mandated interoperability, where we force them to allow third parties to connect to their services, and also a restoration of the right to connect to those services, even without the mandate. So, you know, the equivalent of ripping a CD, but for your the tracks that you stream off of a music service or um, the equivalent of uh, third-party printer ink for your app store, or the equivalent of plugging in a new kind of phone into your phone network, but for Facebook. So you can stay in touch with your Facebook friends without having to use Facebook. And by lowering the switching costs, we will make these companies so much weaker because people who don't like them can leave. We'll also make them better because they'll be worried that people who don't like them will leave. But as they get weaker, we'll make it, it'll make it easier for us to take on more muscular action, like breaking them up, like limiting their bad contractual terms, like limiting what can be in terms of service, like uh, other forms of, of regulation that would make them more democratically accountable and less able to structure the market for our culture. Something to look forward to. Yeah. Let's hope. <laughs> Corey, thank you so much for taking the My time. My pleasure. Podcast. It was lovely to chat with you. It was, it was very nice. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to whatever, what is going to come out of this. Um, for the listeners, uh, this we will interview over the, uh, over the 
sorry, for our listeners, uh, we will interview more people. Um, if you want to stay in the loop, please subscribe to this uh, to this podcast. Uh, or stay tuned because uh, there will be a World Culture website and blog series um, published uh, starting in September 2021. So, Corey, uh, have a nice day and uh, hope to talk to you soon. Um, and thank you very much for taking the time. Oh, you too. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. <laughs>